Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Court Right Service for Sunday, August the 16th. My name is Allison Pinches, and I'm one of the pastoral staff here, and it's my pleasure to be able to welcome you. And we truly welcome you from wherever you are joining us this morning. We are so glad that you are with us, and it is good to be together. We wanted to let you know about a few things that are happening. So it's a very different of sorts, summer of sorts, as I'm sure you're experiencing as well. Um, but we do have some great things happening around our church. Justin mentioned a few of them last week. Um, our summer staff have been up to all kinds of wonderful things in terms of trying to help us connect better with our University Village neighborhood. So if you're curious to see a little bit of what they've been up to, you can go to Courtright Church dot org forward slash community and there's a whole list of some of the things they've been up to uh, if you're curious to sort of see what's been happening uh, we're just delighted with the work that they are doing and the ways that they're helping us uh, to get to know our neighbors better Wanted to also let you know that our uh, art initiative called Courtright Creates is continuing throughout the summer. Our prompt for the summer, it's gonna be the same each week, is just refresh. And so if you are inspired by that and feel like creating anything, and again, it could be visual art, it could be uh, spoken word or poetry or whatever uh, might uh, you might be inclined to do, we would love to hear and see uh, what you create in response to that prompt. And you can email uh, any submissions to artist at courtrightchurch.org. And then you can also always go out and check out our uh, Courtright Creates Gallery at any time. We uh, also want to remind you we have a new initiative called Courtright Learns. This is a book club of sorts where we are reading and learning from Indigenous and Black and authors who are also people of color. And so we want to um, continue to learn together from these voices. And uh, we just had started in July and basically each month we're sending out a list of a few recommended resources. You can pick one from the list. Uh, and then if you're up for it, join a discussion at the end of the month uh, to talk about what we've been learning. So we just had our first discussion this past week and it was uh, just inspiring and challenging and moving to be able to learn together and learn from one another uh, from the authors and their stories that we were reading this past month. So we just sent out a new list of resources for August. If you're interested in finding out more or being part of this, you can email me at allison at courtrightchurch.org. Uh, finally, just want to let you know, uh, we're continuing our summer series of welcoming some guests to the pulpit to be uh, sharing God's word with us. And so this morning we have Howard Sullivan with us. Howard is a member of our own congregation. He and his wife Frances have been with us for about a year now. And Howard is a retired um, minister with the Presbyterian Church of Canada, and we're just delighted that he's with us. Um, fun thing to note, his wife Frances was actually the diagonal minister that helped to start Court Right in its very early days. So they have uh, a long history with our community, and we're delighted to have them back as part of our community, and we're grateful uh, to Howard for sharing from God's Word uh, later this morning. As we enter into a time of worship this morning, let's hear these words from Psalm 95 as we prepare to remember that we are in the presence of God together, even though we are apart. Psalm 95, come let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth, and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. Let's continue now in worship together. Good morning, Courtright. We hope you've had an awesome week. Uh, we want to continue on now in worship as we sing King of Heaven. No one greater 
your glory reign, shining like the day. King of heaven, come. King of heaven, rise up. Who could stand against us? You are strong to save in your mighty of your mercy rescued for your glory we cry Jesus set our hearts towards you that every eye would see you lifted high King of heaven come down King of heaven Your glory reign, shining like the day, King of heaven come. King of heaven rise up, who can stand against us? You are strong to save in your mighty name, King of heaven come. King of Let your glory reign, shining like the day, King of heaven come. King of heaven rise up, who can stand against us? You are strong to save in your mighty name, King of heaven come. You are strong to save in your mighty name. Strong to save in your mighty name, King of Heaven, come. We just want to declare God's kingdom come on earth. Let's just sing those words, King of Heaven, come. King of Heaven, come. King of heaven, come. One more time, sing that out. King of heaven, come. King of heaven, come. God, that is our prayer, that your kingdom would come on earth, that we would see you working in our midst, that your kingdom would uh, reign, that it would, we would see marvelous and wonderful and powerful things as a result of you working in and through us by your spirit. God, it, we have so often struggled to um, enact your kingdom on this earth through our own acts of selfishness, through our own acts of uh, callousness, or just um, we just have not cared to see your kingdom come on this earth. But God, as we think about that, as we think about uh, what that looks like in our lives, in our city, in our nation, in our world. God, we just pray for more of your kingdom to work in us so that we can make it, we, so that we can see it come uh, to light in our world. We ask for more of you and less of us. We pray now that as we prepare to hear from your word, that you would lead us, that you would guide us, that your spirit would speak to us, Lord, about how you would have us live in light of your, uh, your scriptures, your word, God. We pray this in your name. 
Amen. Good morning, Kurt Wright. It is my privilege to be with you this morning. My name is Howard Sullivan, and I'm a retired Presbyterian Church in Canada minister. I'm here as a guest, and uh, I appreciate the opportunity while Alex is on holidays to address you this morning. So without any further ado, let's jump into our worship this morning. Let's open in prayer. Let us pray. O oh God, our Father, maker and redeemer of everything in all creation. We come before you this morning in anticipation that your word will be sufficient to bring about change in a world that is broken. Your word will be sufficient to succor those in pain, to encourage those in despair, and to delight those whose confidence in your love is constant. As we consider the life and words of the shepherd become King David, the man after your own heart. Help us to be renewed in our self-understanding. Accept our broken and contrite hearts as we attempt to approach with clean hands and worship you in the best way we know how. O oh Lord, without you we can do nothing, but with your guidance and blessing, all things are possible. Be with us, we pray, not only in this hour of praise and worship, but in every moment of our lives, that we may truly recognize our purpose in the brilliant opening of the Westminster Confession of Faith. Man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Amen. Friends, the opening of this morning's sermon will be a bit different than usual. We will be sharing a few vignettes summarizing the life of David, the author of our Psalms this morning, to the point that scholars agree he probably wrote them during his exile from the court of Saul while being pursued as a fugitive. He begins as the youngest of eight brothers, the sons of Jesse, engaged in his life as a shepherd boy. Even in this lowly role, the last and least, he exhibited extraordinary courage and skill protecting his father's flocks from lions and bears and all manner of wild beasts. When the prophet Samuel is called by God to anoint a successor to the unfaithful and incompetent Saul, he meets seven sons of Jesse who appear outwardly to be worthy candidates only then to be told by the Lord, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. We are left wondering and perplexed at how two kings of Israel are going to survive and why God would promote such a condition. Next, one of the best known stories in all of the Bible, though often misquoted and misused in our secular world, David defeats the Philistine champion, Goliath. The Lord saves not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hand. 1 Samuel 17, 47. This situation creates an admiration and adulation for David within the Israelite camp that rivals even that of King Saul. This rivalry becomes a dangerous situation for the young warrior David. David is so successful in his out, out uh, service as a warrior in the hands of the king, that people are singing his praise in the streets. Saul has slain his thousands, but David has slain his tens of thousands. This adulation for the young warrior upsets King Saul and leaves him forlorn and in a very, very depressed state. Here we see a picture a representation of what Saul would have been going through bereft and left to his own devices. 
And here we read in 1 Samuel 16, 14, Now the Spirit of the Lord had departed from Saul, and an an evil spirit from the Lord tormented him. So not only had Saul been left by God's Spirit, but God allowed an evil spirit to come and torment him. And so he is left in this madness, this situation where he just cannot cope day to day with the trials and tribulations that that come upon him and the difficulties of ruling the nation of Israel. But even in that difficult state, we are to understand how gifted the young David is, for scripture provides insight into how he is able to provide comfort and solace to Saul in spite of his being possessed by an evil spirit. David comes to Saul with music, with song, with soothing words that manage to release him from that uh, possession, even though Saul is a madman at this point in his life. And finally, after several attempts to murder the young David, there is nothing left for him except a life on the run. David escapes the wrath of Saul with the help of his daughter, Michal, and he attracts around him a band of brigands, those who are there to protect David from Saul, who hunts him down ruthlessly, and eventually they end up serving as mercenaries for the dreaded enemy of Israel, the Philistines. But by the grace of God, David and his men are protected from ever having to confront or make war against their own countrymen. And a tremendous blessing to each of them in this particular situation. And finally, in the penultimate act of faithfulness to his nation and his calling, David refuses several opportunities to press his advantage over Saul. First, preventing his men from killing him, And then, in a personally embarrassing situation, controlling his own desire to be done with the life of a fugitive, allowing the vulnerable King Saul to escape while he's relieving himself in a cave. This is summarized in 1 Samuel 26, 9. But David said to Abisha, Do not destroy him, for who can put out his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless. And so David continues in his fidelity to the king that has been anointed by Samuel, and he is faithful in his service. This faithfulness, this service to God and his anointed is remembered in the New Testament by the Apostle Paul, where in Acts 13.22 he says, After removing Saul, he made David their king. God testified concerning him, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. And so, friends, early in the career of the future king of Israel, we can foresee none of the brutal abuse of power or sinfulness that will peak in the affair with Bathsheba and the murder of her loyal husband, Uriah. At this point, in both vocational preparation in the wilderness and faithful worship, the composition of prayers and psalms that inspire us to this day, David seems on a trajectory to absolute success. Even though he hits the wall of human depravity later in life, He is still a figure larger than life through his writing and his relationship with God. This morning, we'll examine two psalms which reflect both David's growth in faith and the pinnacle of his prophetic understanding in both Psalms 15 and 16. It is my prayer that once we've reflected carefully on these inspired words, we will understand better David is a man after God's own heart. And so we come to the word of the Lord, Psalm 
15, a psalm of David. Lord, who may dwell in your sacred tent? Who may live on your holy mountain? The one whose walk is blameless, who does what is righteous, who speaks the truth from their heart, whose tongue utters no slander, who does no wrong to a neighbor and casts no slur on others, who despises a vile person, but honors those who fear the Lord, who keeps an oath even when it hurts and does not change their mind, who lends money to the poor without interest, who does not accept a bribe against the innocent. Whoever does these things will never be shaken. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Here we have a beautifully composed poem, prayer, psalm, number 15. It opens with an inquisitive word. We've all considered at one point in our Christian walk. Or, if you're new to this possibility, perhaps this is the question that's brought you to worship this morning. David frames the issue with an amazing clarity given the experience of his young life. Imagine yourself in the wilderness, struggling to preserve your life, even though you've been promised the throne of Israel as your immediate destiny. How stark and confusing your state of mind must feel when you consider being a hunted fugitive, a fugitive whose life is forfeit should the present king, King Saul, manage to catch you in a moment of vulnerability. Now remember, here's David's question in verse 1. Lord, who may dwell in your sacred tent? Who may live on your holy mountain? It's a matter of who is worthy to come before God and worship. Serious worshipers have asked themselves this question throughout the centuries. How does a sinful person come before a holy God in worship? A certain school of scholars have examined this text and proposed that the beautiful poetry of David was later used as a processional reading in the temple of Jerusalem. The priests would use the parallel verses as a qualifier to those who arrived on the Sabbath, reminding them they were entering into the presence of the holy and sin-detesting God of Israel. Now, these uh, parallel uh, couplets present six attributes of the uh, faithful worshiper. We're going to examine these six attributes, and I'm going to show them to you here on the screen so that you can have a grasp of what they're all about. Now, first of all, let me establish for you um, the feeling that might have occurred. It's hard to imagine the state of mind you might find yourself in to hear these words shouted over you as you make your weekly pilgrimage to worship. I invite you to consider what it would be like here at Courtright should this be the duty of our greeters on Sunday mornings. So here we go. Here are the couplets, starting A, B, C, D, E, F, okay? So, the one whose walk is blameless, who does what is righteous, who speaks the truth from their heart, whose tongue utters no slander, who does no wrong to a neighbor and casts no slur on others who despises a vile person, but honors those who fear the Lord, who keeps an oath, and even when it hurts, and does not change their mind, who lends money to the poor without interest, who does not accept a bribe against the innocent, 
And so these are the qualifications of a person that is able to worship faithfully. Now I ask you, how would you feel if we established a routine of welcoming you here in the parking lot each Sunday with a parade of statements that describe the worthy worshiper in these terms? <laughs> Perhaps in a Monty Python-like scene, we would ask the first question, who comes to worship the Lord, the God of the universe? This, we would ask, at the entrance to the parking lot from Devere Drive. Then, in a succession, our greeters would hold up placards in stern silence with each of those Hebrew parallelisms that I just read to you. It would be daunting, would it not? It would be like a gauntlet that you had to face as you came to the church. I don't think it would be the recipe for church growth. But friends, lest you think this is too far-fetched for Protestants, especially open-minded Presbyterians, I'm sure there are some within the sound of this service this morning who will remember our history of providing communion tokens. These tokens were provided to congregants who had been examined for their sound Christian living by the elders of the church. Those who were satisfactory were given tokens, and these tokens were exchanged on the Sunday morning when communion was served so that they might receive the blessing of the sacrament. I thank God we have moved past such a stern, demanding interpretation of St. Paul's word to the Corinthians. However, we are left with a wounded conscience wondering how so many could be convinced that this was the correct understanding and application of Paul's stern warning. I dare say that even David, the composer of such a grand vision of a faithful worshiper, fell far short of the goals that were set forth in this psalm. Earlier this month, Lindsay Sitzma expounded Psalm 51, exposing the obvious weaknesses of Israel's great king in a sound teaching on the wages of sin. This week, we encountered David in his youthful vulnerability. He's still establishing his dependency upon God, realizing the truths which will later be abandoned at great cost to his life, and to his legacy. However, David is not merely one of those preachy prophets who merely says, do as I say, not as I do. David is very real, very transparent in his relationships. The flawed human relationships and the flawed yet fully hopeful relationship he has with God. Remember the final phrase of Psalm 15. Whoever does these things will never be shaken. David concludes, if there was one who could keep the statutes of the law, they would be unshakable. They would be the perfect worshiper the one God could accept, the one without blemish, the one who could represent us all. This is the one, I believe, St. Paul was remembering when he penned the words, after removing Saul, he made David their king. God testified concerning him. I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. 
In the anointing of David to replace Saul, God has chosen a man after his own heart. Let's attempt to understand what that might mean by reading the accompanying Psalm 16 which reveals to us David's insight into his own definition of faithful worship. And in a very particular and special way is the second couplet, the second psalm that completes Psalm 15. Friends, hear the word of the Lord. A mitkam of David, Psalm 16. Keep me safe, my God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. Apart from you, I have no good thing. I say of the holy people who are in the land, they are the noble ones in whom is all my delight. Those who run after other gods will suffer more and more. I will not pour out libations of blood to such gods or take their names on my lips. Lord, you alone are my portion and my cup. You make my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have my delightful inheritance. I will praise the Lord who counsels me even at night my heart instructs me. I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure. Because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you let your faithful one see decay. You make known to me the path of your life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. Here ends the reading of the word. May God add his blessing to our understanding. Amen. Now just quickly, the word uh, El in Hebrew is translated God in the way that that uh, psalm was uh, offered to you. And the word Lord is the Hebrew Yahweh in the way that that translation was offered to you from the Hebrew. So let's dive in to Psalm 16. The first thing we noticed in contrast to Psalm 15 is that David is addressing God. The opening verse attends to identifying the God of Israel, as opposed to any false God that could be worshipped in the land. From there, David boldly addresses God by the Hebrew name Yahweh, the symbolic, unspeakable name, I am who I am, which was given to Moses. Nowhere in the psalm do we hear David's righteousness or worthiness to address the Lord, Rather, he is demurring in tone. Without the Lord, he has nothing, and he is pleased to live among the saints of his time. His eye is on the Lord, who counsels him day and night. Then, in this remarkable cross-reference to Psalm 15's final verse, David claims, I will not be shaken. Does this mean David has staked the claim to being a righteous and faithful worshiper? Certainly, I agree that is possibly his intention, but he has placed a huge, significant caveat on his steadfastness. Yahweh, the God of Israel, will be at his right hand. He cannot accomplish this on his own. So we have here this beautiful witness that David is dependent on God. And it is a witness that is beautifully paralleled in the New Testament in Matthew 16, 15 to 17, showing the relationship between Peter and Jesus. Let's hear that word. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say I am? 
Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. To be a martyria, that is, a witness for Jesus, one must have a sense that they haven't reasoned to the truth, they haven't discovered some secret knowledge, which is gnosis in Greek, but they have been touched by God's Spirit in an undeniable way. Through this connection with God, a truth is revealed that nothing in all creation can prevail against. That is what I believe occurred to King David, in my humble opinion. So all-consuming was that moment of spiritual connection with Yahweh that he became momentarily for Israel a prophet, a priest, a king, revealing for all people of faithful worship what we hear in Psalm 1610. A final Hebrew parallelism to draw your attention to the most incredible insight offered in these two psalms that we have shared together this morning. Because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you let your faithful one, capitalized, see decay. In the historic times, 3,000 plus years ago when David lived, 1,000 plus years ago before Jesus Christ made these words alive with truth, David, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, put the possibility of resurrection faith before the people with a certainty that one day God would fulfill his word. Surely, we have a man after God's own heart. Not one who boasts of his power and authority, but one who listens, who gives credit to the Almighty, one who waits upon the Lord. Amen. Thanks be to God for such truth-filled witness. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul. Worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul. I worship Your holy.
near and my time has come still my soul will sing your praise unending ten thousand years and then forevermore forevermore Would you join with me now in prayer? Father God, Son and Holy Spirit, we come before your throne of grace together. And God, we have much to be thankful for, even as there are many things that are heavy on our hearts this morning. So God, we remember your goodness to us. We thank you for the ways that you have been faithful to us uh, throughout these months, um, but throughout generations and in our community for a long time. And God, we thank you for the gift of summer and uh, for the change of season that it brings. We thank you for the joy of sunshine and warmth and being able to be outside. And God, I pray that in all the ways that we need it, that you would use this time to refresh and replenish us uh, for the months and weeks ahead. God, whether that's through vacation and time away or just through getting outside for a walk, I pray that you would be doing that good work uh, to restore and replenish and renew us. Pray in particular for our um, staff and families that might be on vacation this week. We pray again for your deep rest and renewal for them. Would you bless times with family um, and would you uh, care for us all uh, on vacation or not to, to renew us? And God, we think as we, even as we pray these things of the incredible challenges our world is facing at the moment. God, we pray again for Beirut and the people of Lebanon in the wake of the uh, terrible explosion that has uh, claimed so many lives and injured many and caused so much damage in that already fragile country. God, we pray for your mercy, for your peace. We pray for your provision. Um, and we ask that your kingdom would come in mighty ways in Lebanon in this time. God, would you restore um, your order, your shalom, and um, yeah, we ask for that in your name. God, we pray too for countries continuing to um, struggle, well, as we all are in different ways with the uh, COVID 
crisis and we pray for, again, for countries um, that have healthcare systems that are um, struggling to care for those in need. And we just ask again for your provision. We ask that there would be a limit and that new cases would be uh, slowed down and stopped. God, we pray for those that are working on vaccines and all uh, various kinds of treatments. And we ask again for your provision. God, we're reminded in times like these of our desperate need for you. And so I pray that um, in the world sort of being brought to its knees that we would remember um, and be drawn closer to you in the midst of this. God, we think of our own neighborhood and the ways that you have been at work. Uh, we thank you again for our summer staff who've been working so hard. We pray your blessing on them. Uh, for Ruth and Callum and Kira and Jasmine, we thank you for them. And God, we pray that you would bless and multiply their efforts, particularly with our neighborhood. Um, God, we thank you for the ways that they are seeking to engage our community. And we think about all of those flyers that were dropped off in our neighborhood this past week into mailboxes. And God, we pray that you would take this uh, potentially seemingly small thing and do far more than we can ask or imagine. We pray that you would help uh, use that to spur connections between our church community and our neighbors. God, would you help us to um, be a presence and a light and a gift in this community? And we pray for um, continued creativity of ways to do that and for us to find favor with our neighbors in these connections. God, we pray that um, the efforts of our staff in terms of helping people to feel welcome on our property uh, would, again, that you would increase and do far more with that than we can imagine. Things like uh, welcoming with our little dog walking station and our uh, small outdoor library and all of these things, God. Pray that they would um, accomplish far more than what they could on their own because of your hand being on them. We pray again for, for favor and good connections with our neighbors. God, we pray too for our mission prayer request this week. We think of the um, Association Civil Campos Blanchard and their administrator, Sergio Hergenrether, um, and for this ministry that's deeply connected to Jim Kloss as he provides discipleship and project management. God, we pray for your blessing on this cultural training center as they try to serve God with excellence in missions and in Bible translations. God, we pray again for your um, outpouring of grace and wisdom as they continue to lead in, in challenging times. And we thank you for them and for, for Jim Kloss. God, again, we have uh, a much to be grateful for, but we continue to recognize our need for you. And so in all these things that we have brought before, we, we do ask that you would do more than we can imagine. Um, and we offer ourselves and our community to you. In your name we pray. Amen. And now go in peace, and may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace, both now and forevermore. Amen.